Carolina Andreozzi, I'm an assistant researcher here at Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Today, I'm with one of our assistant professors, James Cameron, to talk about his new book, The Double Game, recently published by Oxford University Press. James, can you tell us what is The Double Game about? The Double Game uh, is about a period uh, in the Cold War uh, between 1961 and 1972. Uh, when uh, the superpowers went from really being on the precipice of nuclear conflict uh, to finding a way in which to negotiate between themselves on the control of nuclear weapons. So the double game really uh, looks at this transformation, how uh, the superpowers went uh, from a period of confrontation uh, to a period of negotiation uh, over uh, nuclear weapons. Mm, James. Nuclear arms during the Cold War has been the subject of quite a few books. What makes the double game different? So yeah, so there's been a lot of uh, uh, writing on the strategic arms limitation over the years, um, both at the time uh, and subsequently in uh, histories that have written quite recently. Uh, what's different about the double game is that it uses uh, the conversations that John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon had with their most trusted advisors uh, to try to get inside um, their internal deliberations, right? To see um, the choices that they made over nuclear weapons from their perspective. And what makes uh, this period particularly interesting is that Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon all recorded their conv conversations uh, to a greater or lesser extent. So it's a really unique period uh, in presidential history where we have this amazing resource, uh, the, the recordings of their conversations with people like their Secretary of Defense and their National Security Advisors. So this is, this is unique. That's a very particular characteristic of your book, relying on recordings of President's private meetings. What's the reason, in your point of view, to justify JFK, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon recording their private conversations with advisors and White House staff in the first place? Uh, they recorded their conversations, I think, for pos posterity, for their own uh, uh, memoirs. Um, I don't think there was a great uh, anticipation that this material would be public. Um, at, during this period, um, there was an assumption um, that the conversations would be private and they would be kept private. And it was really um, only after uh, Watergate, the Watergate scandal, uh, where uh, Nixon had to release um, a number of the recordings uh, made by the White House taping system that this assumption changed. So, um, so that was the reason, really, I think, for their own memories uh, and for their own uh, personal use, rather than as a public record. Um, but we're very lucky, um, as historians, that they made uh, this mistake. So. How did those recordings between the president and his advisors display the contrast between the three presidents' public figures and their private doubts about the U.S. nuclear strategy? And why did they keep those a secret? Yeah, so the double game uh, refers to um, this, this duality between the public face um, of the presidents and their private doubts. Um, and we see the private doubts really come through in the tapes. So the tapes are a unique uh, resource for that, question, for that particular reason. Um, because you see uh, Kennedy, Johnson to some extent less so, and Nixon in particular, question the wisdom of what they're saying in public about nuclear weapons. Um, so, um, so that's the, why did they keep it secret? Um, they kept it secret um, because they were worried about the impact that their doubts would have on the public um, at large. Um, in particular, um, they were worried about moving outside of the consensus position um, that many people, uh, that the, the domestic public um, had. So for example, during um, John F. Kennedy's uh, period between 1961 and 1963, um, the assumption in the public sphere was that nuclear superiority over the Soviet Union was fundamental uh, to the United States' ability to deter uh, the Soviet Union from starting a conflict. Um, Kennedy had doubts about that. He had doubts um, in particular um, during the Cuban, after the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, 
but because um, his position or his doubts, the doubts that he was feeling, were so far outside of the accepted uh, public consensus regarding nuclear weapons, he felt that he couldn't really express them. And indeed, in certain instances, he expressed feelings that were, uh, were expressed a position that was directly um, counter to the doubts that he was, um, he was expressing in, in private. In your opinion, what part did nuclear weapons play in JFK's image, and how did the Cuban Missile Crisis affect Kennedy's stance on the subject? So, um, so Kennedy went into the 1960 presidential election um, with a very strong position uh, on nuclear weapons, and he criticized President Eisenhower, uh, his predecessor, uh, for, uh, for the way in which he had allowed the United States to slip behind the Soviet Union in the quantity and quality of, uh, of, of nuclear weapons. Um, this was the general perception. It turned out that that wasn't the case, but this was the public perception uh, after the Soviet Union successfully tested um, the Sputnik satellite uh, in 1957. So that was the perception. Kennedy said on a number of occasions in the late 50s and throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, presidential election in 1960, um, that Eisenhower had allowed uh, the United States to slip, to slip behind and he would uh, rebuild uh, the United States' uh, nuclear strength. And by rebuilding the nu United States' nuclear strength, uh, the US would be able to confront the Soviet Union uh, in a more confident way uh, after, after um, he had implemented these nuclear programs. Um, the Berlin crisis of 1961 and the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 uh, were very uh, important for JFK because they were real confrontations so with the Soviet Union uh, over um, particular political issues. So um, the division of, uh, of, of Berlin uh, in 1961, the deliver division of Berlin in 1961, and, uh, and um, the emplacement of uh, nuclear missiles in Cuba by the Soviet Union in 1962. And um, Kennedy in those situations where the, um, the danger of nuclear war um, was so close, there was such an imminent danger of nuclear war, Kennedy be, uh, began uh, to question uh, his assumptions about the utility of, uh, of an advantage uh, in nuclear weapons. Um, he began to uh, think about, um, well, actually, and he says this on one of the tapes, he says, um, what the Soviet Union had in Cuba a few nuclear weapons, nothing like the size of the uh, United States arsenal, were enough to deter me uh, from invading Cuba, right? So he begins to think a lot about the, um, the balance, the nuclear balance. And he thinks, well, does the balance, he begins to sort of look at, think in his mind, does the balance really matter? Um, am I more confident because I have more nuclear weapons? And I think the evidence suggests that he wasn't uh, more confident, that the fear of nuclear escalation and the fear of using even one nuclear weapon uh, was enough uh, to uh, deter him uh, from starting a war, and he thought uh, enough to deter the Soviet Union from starting a war. So the assumption that he had um, that an advantage in nuclear weaponry somehow would give you more confidence, um, he, he began to question that assumption in the final few years of his life, I think. Now let's move on to the Johnson administration. Taking into account the manner in which he came into office after JFK's sudden assassination. How did nuclear weapons fit into his administration? Yeah, so uh, Lyndon Johnson assumed the presidency on the day uh, of, of Kennedy's assassination. And uh, Johnson, uh, the first thing Johnson had to do uh, was to assure the American public that he was in control and that he knew what he was doing. Um, and that included uh, in the sphere of the Cold War. And I think that uh, impulse was one of the key uh, elements in Johnson's kind of political compass, if you like, um, was that he needed to assure people um, that, uh, that he was in control. And that meant uh, for Johnson uh, maintaining JFK's position on nuclear superiority, the public position, which was that nuclear superiority was important and that the United States should maintain that position. The problem for Johnson was that his main love uh, wasn't the Cold War at all, it was social reform. Uh, and social reform costs money. Um, and so Johnson's um, main, 
the main challenge for his presidency was to balance the cost of the Cold War, including the cost of the nuclear arms budget, uh, with his big social reform program, which overall was called the Great Society, right? Um, and the problem for Johnson was that it soon became clear um, that this was going to be quite a difficult balance um, to, to strike um, for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, the Congress was much more fiscally conservative than he was. Um, so he, um, he had to convince them that he was going to keep the, balance, the budget under control. But secondly, um, the Congress was also much more conservative in terms of um, its ideas on nuclear weapons, right? So um, if anything was going to be cut, um, it, would be, uh, it would be the social programs and not the military budget. And the third problem that really uh, began uh, to, to vex Johnson uh, as, as his presidency progressed was the war in Vietnam and the huge costs and that were associated with the war. And so for Johnson, uh, the key was to keep uh, the cost of nuclear weapons down. As all of these other pressures, the pressure of the Great Society and the pr pressure of Vietnam in particular, uh, began uh, to, uh, to, to increase, uh, Johnson wanted to keep the nuclear weapons budget under control. And the problem for Johnson was that the Soviets were advancing in nuclear weapons as well. And they were um, beginning to endanger uh, the United States lead in a number of different areas. And so for Johnson, um, the only way that he could get out of this problem uh, to prevent uh, spending more money on the arms race um, was to reach out to the Soviet Union and try to begin uh, negotiations on controlling uh, the nuclear arms race between the two superpowers. You mentioned Johnson's need of showing the public that he was in control and that the US involvement in the Vietnam War was a part of his policy. What was the impact of the Vietnam War on his nuclear policy strategy? Yes, so the Vietnam War did uh, impact uh, US nuclear strategy uh, because it placed um, much greater pressure on the budget. Um, they kept on having to um, ask for um, greater and greater appropriations from Congress to pay for the war, um, far greater than they anticipated. And so the, the Vietnam War definitely put a limit um, on, on, uh, on expenditures, um, and it also um, made Johnson and his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, uh, much more interested in reaching out to the Soviet Union to tr try and control uh, the, the cost of the arms race. Um, in another way, the other way that it impacted um, the domestic politics of US nuclear strategy was that the culture war, the war between those who were for, for uh, US involvement in Vietnam and those who were against, began to move into other areas of US foreign policy, including nuclear weapons. So what you see in the mid to late 60s, particularly in the late 60s, is this new group emerging, which are people who are very, very interested in controlling the arms race and trying to rein back uh, US military spending because they saw the war in Vietnam as indicative, as a sort of, uh, how can we put this? They saw the war in Vietnam as, um, sorry, they saw the war in Vietnam as a, as a symptom um, of, uh, of, of the greater failings of uh, US policy during the Cold War, which was the United States was spending too much on military programs and not enough on social programs. And so you had this, uh, divergence, in particular in the United States Congress, uh, between people who wanted uh, arms control and people who said, no, we have to continue the arms race with the Soviet Union, uh, essentially because they saw uh, the Soviet Union as the greatest threat to US national security. So there was a big, there were two impacts really. One uh, was on the fiscal side, on the budgetary side, um, and the other was to create this division uh, in the United States Congress uh, in the late 60s over the, um, over the uh, future direction of US uh, nuclear strategy. Considering that there was public pressure for the US to reduce military spending, and this was one of the reasons why Nixon signed the Strategic Arms Limitation Agreement with the USSR, even though he had serious doubts about nuclear parity, why did he, did he go on to sign the agreement anyway? Yeah, so Nix, this was Nixon's double game. So Nixon's double game was different from Johnson and Kennedy. Nixon was a true believer in the uh, utility of US nuclear superiority. So he really believed that in order to have confidence uh, in crises with the Soviet Union, you would have to have 
an edge in the quantity and quality of US nuclear weapons. Um, now, the problem for Nixon was that when he was inaugurated in, in January 1969, this culture war over um, the future of US nuclear strategy was beginning to peak. Um, and so what he found was that Nixon, uh, Nixon really found that he didn't have the votes um, for um, major new nuclear programs, including a missile defense system for the United States. And this is a program that Johnson had left uh, on the side. He'd started building it, but he hadn't appropriated all the money for it. Um, and Nixon um, basically went into 1969, into his, the first year of his presidency, um, asking uh, Congress for a large amount of money for a missile defense system for the US. And so um, Congress um, put up far more resistance uh, to this than Nixon was expecting. He was really surprised by how far the culture war over Vietnam had spread into areas like nuclear weapons. And so Nixon was forced into a position where he had to, he had to negotiate with the Soviet Union uh, on arms control uh, because he, he, um, he needed uh, to maintain uh, the US uh, position uh, in the arms race because he couldn't get any money from Congress. Congress was now putting so much resistance um, to new US nuclear programs that um, that an uh, that, uh, arms control agreement with the Soviet Union uh, became a necessity for Nixon. And so Nixon, ironically, somebody who didn't really believe um, in uh, nuclear parity and equality with the nucle uh, nuclear equality with the Soviet Union, uh, was forced into signing two uh, agreements uh, with the USSR in 1972. Uh, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which banned uh, national missile defenses for the two superpowers, and an interim agreement uh, freezing nuclear, offen uh, nuclear offensive forces. Um, and so Nixon, the, of the three presidents, the one who didn't believe uh, that the U United States could live with nuclear uh, parity, um, a sort of rough equivalence in, u in nuclear forces, was ironically the president uh, who had to sign the, uh, the agreements. Considering the status of the international system, what are the implications of the double game for the current nuclear studies? So I've been thinking a lot about um, the current implications. Um, so I think one of the things that we have to, um, one of the things that the double game highlights um, is the special place of nuclear rhetoric, presidential nuclear rhetoric uh, in uh, US nuclear strategy. And it's, I think it's important uh, for people to realize as we go into this new period, um, this new period of confrontation perhaps, uh, with other uh, major global powers, um, that presidential rhetoric cannot be uh, simply what a president is feeling at a particular time about a particular topic, right? So you can't just say uh, whatever you think um, about nuclear weapons and expect that uh, to be a US policy. What you have to do is you have to, you have to balance, you have to measure um, words very, very carefully. And so I think this is particularly um, uh, appropriate time to be reflecting on this uh, when we have a president uh, in the United States who, appar who apparently thinks it's okay um, to uh, just say what he, whatever he thinks um, about, uh, about US nuclear weapons or US nuclear forces, US nuclear strategy. And so I think um, the gut double game does have a lesson, um, a fairly relevant lesson um, as we uh, move forward into this new um, this new period, and I think it would be good um, for presidents, perhaps, or, or their advisors, um, certainly, to reflect um, on, on the history and uh, the way in which Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, in particular, um, struggled um, to reconcile their private feelings and their private doubts uh, with the demands um, of, of the office, office of the President of the United States. Thanks, James, for being here. Thank you very much, my pleasure. The Double Game was released worldwide on December 1st and it's available online. Thanks for watching.